Tabitha's story begins in Joppa, an ancient seaport along the Mediterranean. Now you and I might remember this harbor city as the place Jonah fled to when he heard God's call to Nineveh. Joppa's international anchorage was so well represented that Jonah knew he could board a ship to the farthest reaches of the west in the opposite direction of Assyria as soon as he arrived. Further back in its history, Joppa represented the territory allotted to the tribe of Dan in the book of Joshua. And when the Danites lost their territory, they were really only able to reclaim Leshem. Centuries afterward, when Solomon built his palace and the temple, the massive cedar logs he conscripted had to come through Joppa's port, the only natural harbor between Egypt to the south and Akko to the north. Again, a thousand years later, at the rebuilding of the temple, the lumber needed to come through Joppa. So imagine a bustling metropolis with thriving import-export trade, merchant families living in impressive homes, the sounds of creaking ships and gulls, languages from around the world, temples and houses of worship representing dozens of religions, the smell of incense in the air, antique wood and tar, wine bars and inns with an overflowing clientele of travelers and seafarers. It was an easy place to get lost in, to start over to begin an adventure. And Joppa also represented the meeting of many cultures, because even though it was one of Palestine's most important port cities, and certainly Jerusalem's most important, Joppa also bordered the Sumerian area and occupied the Phoenician region. And that brings us to the unique and intriguing story of a woman with dual citizenship, as it were, a woman known for her good deeds, the only woman who was actually called a disciple in the entire Christian Testament, whose death rocked her Christian community to its core, and her deliverance by being raised back to life generated widespread belief in the Lord. So let's begin with Tabitha, the disciple. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. This is the only place in the Christian Testament where the word mathetria, or female disciple, shows up. So we want to pay special attention to what being a disciple meant, both in first century Palestine and to Christians in particular. Scholar Alan Culpepper found nine similar characteristics among the various schools of antiquity that define what being a disciple meant. It begins with uh, an emphasis on brotherhood and sisterhood and fellowship. Think koinonia, fellowship of the saints. Next, disciples gathered around a wise and good person, and in this case, that meant Jesus. Disciples valued their teacher's words and traditions, and others recognized them as disciples. Disciples involved themselves in teaching and learning and studying, and they had communal meals together. So for Christians, that meant the Lord's Supper. Disciples established practices for admitting and keeping new members, in this case, baptism, and advancing within the group, which meant training. Disciples maintained some distance from the rest of the society, and you recognize that in the letters of Paul, urging Christians and even Jesus to be in the world, but not of it. And finally, disciples sustained the school for the future, and think about the saints devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. A close examination of Tabitha's life and ministry revealed that all these things were true about her, and we're going to see that as we go deeper into her story. But there is more. The Greek phrase is actually tis en mathetria, meaning there was a certain female disciple. In other words, even though she is the only named woman who is given the title disciple, the Gospels reveal there were actually many women who were officially Jesus' disciples, and several of them are named. For example, Mary the Magdalene, Joanna the wife of Herod steward Hosea, Susanna and the Samaritan woman, Mary who was Jesus' mother, Martha and Mary of Bethany. Luke made a point of translating Tabitha's Aramaic name into Greek, Dorcas. Having two names represented connection between the Jewish culture and the Greek culture which should be unsurprising in a city like Joppa. As one theologian said, in Tabitha's person, she can be seen as showing the unity of the Jewish and Gentile church. Each group shows its own identity, its own name, but they function as a body working together. She celebrates what should be multiculturalism in the church. 
Both names also mean gazelle, a deer known for its beauty and grace, for a ruddy stripe on its coat, and for its small and delicate shape. Perhaps, when she was born, she looked tiny and fragile, and she had red hair and was a beautiful baby. But Tabitha's name holds even more meaning, something Luke wanted his readers to know and to think about. The gazelle, according to the Torah, was an animal that could not be offered as sacrifice, but it could be eaten. It was not quite a domestic animal, but there are ancient records of deer and gazelle occasionally joining and staying with a herd, and they were both admired and beloved. What's more, a person did not have to be ritually purified to eat deer and gazelle, and that made it a favorite among hunters and travelers. The gazelle occupied a liminal space. It lived between clean and unclean, domestic and wild, and it was welcome in both realms. The gazelle was also a metaphor for a proselyte, one from another culture or people group who now was a God-fearer, and later catechumens or converts to Christianity who were still learning their catechism in preparation for baptism. Both Jewish and Christian theologians pointed to Psalm 42 as their guiding passage. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? This was the deeper meaning of Tabitha's name. She was either a Greek proselyte, one of many women of means and high standing who became believers throughout the stories of Acts, or she was a Jewish woman born to a Greek father of some wealth and position, who now had chosen to identify herself with her Jewish roots. Because she's not named in association with a male figure, we can surmise she was the head of her own household, and it was a large home. She had the ability to house both staff and widows, and she was affluent enough to produce a great deal of textiles, clothing for the poor. It's possible Tabitha was a widow, but she might also have been young and as yet unmarried, or an established patron, a landowner, and a guilds member of her craft, who had remained single. There is one last association with Tabitha's name Gazelle, and it reaches back to the story Luke told right beforehand. Now as Peter went here and there among all the believers, he came also to the saints living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now, in Greco-Roman culture, Aeneas was a famous name. He was a hero who featured in the adventures of Virgil's Aeneid. And in the Aeneid, the queen of Carthage, Dido, falls in love with Aeneas. But he eventually breaks her heart by leaving her in order to fight for Rome. In Greek and Roman tragedies, hunted and wounded gazelle and deer were often the depiction of tragic women, and Dido was no exception, who eventually died by her own hand, using Aeneas' sword. Later, very similar events occurred in Cleopatra's life, and both women were likened to tragic, wounded gazelles or deer. And Luke was going to show that the kingdom of God uh, is about the goodness of God that brings life to all who believe. By putting these two names together, Aeneas and Dorcas, or Gazelle, in close proximity like they were, Luke was calling to mind a motif, that the spread of the Roman Empire brought collateral damage, tragedy, and death. But the spread of God's kingdom is profoundly different. So now having introduced the motif, what happened next would not have been unexpected. The delicate gazelle tragically succumbs to death. So starting from the beginning, now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and he went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. 
So who were the disciples who sent for Peter? Well, at least they were the widows who had washed Tabitha and laid her out in this upper room and who grieved over her. You see, early on, it seems, many widows, both Hebrew and Hellenist, had become believers. So many, in fact, it had become difficult to make sure they were all being treated fairly. And evidently, the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So, the twelve appointed seven deacons, who were full of the Spirit and of wisdom, to oversee the fair treatment of these Hellenist widows. Later, James, the head of the Jerusalem church, commended this ministry, and he said such service was pure and undefiled before God. There were so many widows who over time had become believers that Paul finally laid out some basic principles to follow in their ministry. A true widow was someone who did not have any family or anyone else who could help them. They were truly alone in the world, and so this person would be someone who had set her hope on God, and her ministry would be continuous in supplications and prayer, night and day. Now this sounds a lot like the prophet Anna, who was also aged, who was also a widow, and who never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. Paul felt that such women, like Anna, should be truly aged and should have been faithful to their husbands, and well attested to their good works. Paul gave some easy examples to go by. For example, rearing children, being hospitable, especially to fellow believers, or having help to the afflicted. Paul ended his list by saying such women are recognized in having devoted themselves to doing good in every way. So imagine then, mostly aged widows with nowhere else to go, coming to live with Tabitha where they could devote themselves day and night to prayer and supplication, where they could help those in their surrounding community who were afflicted, and maybe even help care for the children of believers, to be hospitable to everyone, but especially in such matters as providing a place for Christian apostles and prophets and teachers to stay who were traveling through, and in every way to dedicate themselves to doing good. Often upper rooms were added by prosperous homeowners in order to accommodate long-term guests or tenants and to accommodate large meetings. So Tabitha's ministry might actually be the earliest example of a monastery or convent. And all of this was made possible by Tabitha's wealth and her independence. Like the deacons in Jerusalem, we can surmise she was full of the spirit and of wisdom. And we know that as a disciple, she studied and taught scripture and the teachings of the apostles, and that she served Christ out of her own ability, her own resources, her own talents and gifting. And the many widows in her Christian community could count on her. As head of household, she would have hosted their communal meals together, including their love feasts and the sharing of the Lord's Supper. And everyone who knew her experienced her devotion and her compassion and her generosity. Hers was a beautiful spirit, but also hers was practical care. Her death felt like a disaster to her whole household, really to the whole assembly of believers. So they sent for Peter, who by God's providence was already in nearby Lydda, only 12 miles away. So even though this was a horrific situation for them, they still dared to believe God would somehow work a miracle for them. They had put their faith in Jesus, who had healed many lepers who were as good as dead, restored sight to the blind, voices to the mute, hands and feet to the halt and lame, and had cast out countless demons. They knew the stories of Jesus raising the widow's dead son and Nain, and the synagogue ruler's dead daughter, and Lazarus of Bethany, who had been dead for over four days. So they hoped against hope that God would do something powerful for them in their great need and sorrow. The kingdom of God is about hope in the love and kindness and goodness and power of God. When Peter arrived, he was met with this grieving household of widows, who most likely were themselves the disciples who had sent for him. For Peter, there must have been echoes of the time he had accompanied Jesus into the room of a little girl who had died, and whom Jesus had raised to life. When Jesus and the disciples came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. It was the same scenario. And perhaps 
That scene also triggered Peter's memory of what Jesus had told the grieving household. The child is not dead, but sleeping. Sometimes this is how the Lord speaks to us today, bringing to mind a passage in Scripture that will apply in a fresh way to the circumstances we're facing. Peter seemed to know exactly what he was to do. It seems the Holy Spirit had brought to mind, just as Jesus had promised, everything Peter needed to remember about the raising of Jairus' daughter. Jesus put them all outside. Jesus took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means in Aramaic, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. So Peter followed the way of the Lord. Peter put all of them outside. And then he knelt down and prayed and he turned to the body and he said, Tabitha kum, get up. And then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. So he gave her his hand and he helped her up. And then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. Tabitha also became an example of Christ. She sacrificed herself for others. She died and was mourned by all those in her care, and she was raised to new life, prompting many conversions. Because what happened? This became known through Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. In this supernatural second ending to the usual tale of the tragic wounded deer motif, the outward movement of God's kingdom brings healing to wounds inflicted by the old life, and resurrection to new life. Not only was Tabitha returned to the community and household who loved her, but news of God's great power and love and compassion spread throughout the region, affirmed by the growing assemblies of believers in Samaria and the Galilee. Imagine Tabitha's powerful and convincing testimony. As would later happen with Paul, she really died, and she met Jesus face to face. Perhaps Tabitha, like Paul, might have said she had been caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. And during that brief and blissful experience, together with the Lord, Tabitha must have felt as torn as Paul later expressed. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. As Peter prayed over her dead body, imagine the Lord saying to Tabitha, It is necessary for you to return for the widows I have given into your care, and for the many, many people who will put their faith in me because of the new life I am giving to you. What must that have been like for Tabitha to leave the full presence of our Savior and open her eyes once again in that dimly lit upper room, to see Peter's bowed head and hear perhaps the prayers and weeping of her beloved household just outside the door. What must she have felt as Peter took her by the hand and led her out to the rooms below, filled to overflowing with the whole assembly of believers? And that assembly was about to grow far larger because so many people in the surrounding area put their faith in Jesus as a result that Peter decided he better remain with the people to teach them and shepherd this growing church. And Tabitha's dual culturalism was also a prophetic sign of what was soon to come. Peter had slowly been making his way up the coast. Now that he decided to stay for a time, he would enjoy the welcoming atmosphere of Joppa. He was going to take rooms with Simon the Tanner. He's actually a man whose work with dead animals rendered him ritually unclean most of the time. But it was here God was soon going to give Peter a vision that would change the course of Christianity. Because the kingdom of God is for all people. Peter may have thought he had really broadened his horizons, having now laid hands on Samaritans so they might receive the Holy Spirit, um, raised to life a woman who was not fully Jewish, and now he was making his home with a man who was ritually unclean every day. But understandably, Peter was still thinking like a righteous Jewish man would. 
observing Torah and the law of Moses as best he could. But God was about to show him that the kingdom Jesus had ushered in was going to be for all people. And God was going to show this to Peter with a startling and unsettling vision. Perhaps as God lowered that tablecloth covered with all kinds of animals, Tabitha's name whispered in Peter's mind. The kingdom of God, like the gazelle and deer, would be available for the clean and unclean alike. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in God may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him.